Hello everyone, I am Avik Kondo and today we will start the first part of this chapter Geomorphic Processes and Landforms of the Earth. Before going into detail about this chapter, I just want to give you the brief concept about this chapter. Actually, the geomorphic processes and the landform, these two terms are very much correlated or interrelated with each other. Because geomorphology is a significant branch of physical geography where we not only the study the landforms of the earth but also the different type of geomorphic processes. Actually the geomorphic processes are of two types where one is responsible to modify the existing landforms over the earth's surface and another one is create the new landforms on the earth's surface. It means that the one is form the new landforms on the earth's surface, another one is modifying the existing landforms. But in that case, that all these geomorphic processes have their clear distinctive imprints on the earth's surface. According to W.D. Thornbury, that the geomorphic processes always have their clear distinctive imprints on the earth's surface. And by these imprints, we can easily separate out themselves one from the another. There are different type of geomorphic processes to which is differently segregated or categorized one from the another according to their nature of work, nature of activity and the processes. And also these geomorphic processes have their clear distinctive characteristics by which we can easily separate out themselves one from the another. Now the general classifications of the landforms. There are three types of landforms are there mountains, plateaus and plains. The mountains, plateaus and plains all are also classified further but before going in detail about such kind of classification we have to concentrate on the geomorphic processes. I already said that there are two types of geomorphic processes. One is the exogenetic forces, another one is the endogenetic forces. Now come to the exogenetic forces. Exogenetic force or the process where the force or energy are confined over the earth's surface. So this is known as exogenetic forces. The energy always confined over the earth's surface. Now come to the endogenetic forces where the energy always coming from the earth's interior. So this is the basic difference between the exogenetic and the endogenetic forces. The exogenetic forces, the energy always confined over the earth's surface and in case of endogenetic forces, the energy is coming from the earth's interior. Now come to the endogenetic forces. Endogenetic forces means the force or the process where the energy is always coming from the earth's interior and causes the formation of new landforms over the earth's surface. This is the most important features of this endogenetic process where if we concentrate on the definition then definitely the energy is coming from the earth's interior. So that is the most important thing that the energy is coming from the earth's interior and the energy is always responsible to what to create a new landforms over the earth's surface maybe the mountains maybe the plateaus but the new landforms are formed on the earth's surface this is the endogenetic forces say for example the magma or volcanism where the magma will erupt and form the new volcano over the earth's surface so this is the newly formed landform that means due to the magma eruption or volcanic eruptions now come to the classifications of the endogenetic forces. Classification of endogenetic forces are of actually two types. That is number one, the diastrophism. Another one is the sudden endogenetic forces. First of all, the diastrophism. In that case of diastrophism, the entire part or the vast extended part area of the earth's surface will definitely modify or create a new landform with a slow steady rate. That is the most important feature of the diastrophism where the extended area of the earth's surface will have a change or gone into the change by a slow steady rate. In case of diastrophism, there are three types of categories. The number one is the tectonic, another one is the isostatic, another one is the eustatic. There are three types of movements are there. Number one is the tectonic movement, another one is the isostatic movement, another one is the eustatic movement. So first of all, the tectonic movement. Tectonic movement means all these crustal blocks or the plates rather. So crustal blocks, they are floating over the high density asthenosphere. So that means these crustal blocks will move either according to them, their nature of activity, either they will move towards each other or it will move away from each other. Either they will move vertically or that will move parallelly. So now come to the, the classifications of the tectonic movement where there are two types of classifications are there. Number one is the epidogenic movement, another one is the orogenic movement. 
in case of epigenetic movement the vertical upliftment of the crustal blocks is very important that means either they are uplifted or they are subsided that means in case of epigenetic movement any crustal blocks either uplifted or subsided vertically it means that the crustal blocks will move vertically with the earth surface now come to the orogenic movement where the crustal blocks will move parallel with the earth surface though we are saying the term the earth surface but you all know that the sur surface of the earth or the shape of the earth is in arc shape it is very difficult to imagine any parallel straight line along with the arc so that means in that case we have to imagine a straight line that will pass in a definite point of the arc that straight line right now which has been drawn by me that is known as tangent so definitely if the crustal blocks will move parallel with this particular straight line or the tangent that is known as orogenic movement in that case of orogenic movement we have to remember that the crustal blocks will move either parallel with the earth surface or better to say it will move parallel with the tangential plane that is the basic difference between the epigenetic and the orogenic movement where in case of epigenetic movement the crustal blocks will move vertically uplifted or subsided with the earth surface but in case of orogenic movement that particular crustal blocks will move parallel with the earth surface or with the tangential plane now come to the isostatic movement or isostasy actually it is a concept it's not a theory in case of the isostasy the concept is given by the ard now the concept is actually stated that all the landforms whatever we are seeing over the earth surface that means the mountains plateaus or plains these all these landforms have are their one third part or the one ninth part of their entire volume and the remaining two third part or the eight ninth part is always subducted under the asthenosphere as you all know that the entire crustal blocks or different type of crustal blocks are moving or floating above the asthenosphere so in that particular concept it has been given that these landforms or the mountains or the mountain peaks say for example the mount everest mount everest has the height of 8848 meter and this 8848 is actually the one third part or the one ninth part of the entire mount everest and the remaining two third part or the remaining eight ninth part is subducted under the asthenosphere so this is the basic concept about the isostasy and the same thing happen for the plateaus same thing happen for the plains also so for example if i take three type of wooden blocks having a constant depth and the width but varying in the height suppose the e3 cross wooden blocks have their different heights like the 5 meter 3 meter and 2 meter if i float the entire three blocks in a water then definitely they will float individually according to their entire volume the one third part of their individual volume or the one ninth part of their individual volume they will float above the water and the remaining part will definitely subducted under the water just like these wooden blocks the entire landforms that means the mountains plateaus and the plains they are also floating over the high density asthenosphere so this is the concept of the isostasy and this concept first given by the scientist ary a i r y ary now come to the eustatic movement very important about this my particular movement eustatic movement means that similarly there is a vertical upliftment or subsidence of the earth crust it is not exactly the entire earth crust the most important thing is that such kind of movement is occurred in that only in the coastal region so this is the most important thing that the coastal region is always experience with such kind of eustatic movement in that case of eustatic movement uh, in india the western coastal plains are always sometimes vertically uplifted or subsided due to the such kind of movement and in that eustatic movement only the coastal strips or the narrow coastal strip have some sort of experiences now come to the sudden endogenetic forces in case of sudden endogenetic forces there are two types of example the clear example which actually uh, state the nature or the characteristics of the sudden endogenetic forces the number one is the earthquake another one is the volcano as you all know about the earthquake so earthquake is actually a very rapid process where we know that the entire landforms or the part of the earth surface changes very rapidly 
but in case of volcano volcano in comparison with the earthquake is a very comparatively a slow process but we are we are not trying to compare the earthquake and volcano we are actually comparing such kind of endogenetic or sudden endogenetic forces with the diastrophism in case of diastrophism it's a very slow rate whatever it is with tectonic movement whatever it is isostatic or the eustatic movement all these processes are actually getting a slow and steady changes we cannot identify their changes or the modification or the creations of the earth surface in the open eye but in case of sudden endogenetic forces means the earthquake and the volcano the entire part will change rapidly and we can easily identify these changes so this is known as the earthquake and the volcano the sudden endogenetic forces now come to the exogenetic forces exogenetic forces means the force or the energy are always confined over the earth surface so that's why they are called external forces if we concentrate on the definition of the exogenetic forces there is a clear stated that the force is energy or the force or the energy is known as the external forces external forces means or external process means the force or energy are always confined over the earth surface they are basically responsible to modifications of the landform so this is the basic difference between the endogenetic and the exogenetic force processes where in case of endogenetic forces or the processes the new landforms are formed but in case of the exogenetic forces or the processes the existing landforms are modified and so that's why they are called external processes now come to the agents of the exogenous processes there are different type of exogenous processes are there and their agents are also there so like the first exogenous processes are is the running water or the river so this is the most important thing that the running water or the river is a very uh, example prominent example in the tropical climate not only that the running or water or river or the glacier wind ocean currents ground water weathering and the mass movements so these are the agents of the exogenous processes we are actually uh, we have a very good concept about such kind of agents and their activity but we not don't know the concept of such kind of a activity of that particular agents actually the process by which these agents work maybe they erode the any landform maybe they deposit on the earth surface so all these activity are known as the exogenetic processes now come to the the types of the exogenetic processes there are two types of exogenetic processes number 1 is the weathering and the number 2 is the gradational process so first of all the weathering in case of the weathering the disintegration and the decomposition of the rock strata is known as weathering so disintegration and the decomposition both are occurred either physically or chemically so the rock strata of the mountainous region may be disintegrated or fragmented into pieces or also decomposed by some chemical reactions so this is known as weathering though it is known as the static process weathering is basically a static process now come to the gradation before we go in detail about the gradation we have to know about the degradation and the aggradation these two are the basic classifications of the gradation first of all the degradation the degradation means the decreasing of height decreasing of height means the height of the landform will decrease by the degradational process that means the suppose say for example the river river will degrade the landform it means river will erode the landform so there is a basic difference between the process of the uh, geomorphic concept and also there is a difference of the activity of the erosional agent if we say that the river erode the landform this is the activity of the agent and if we say the landforms is degraded it is the geomorphic processes it means that the, the decreasing of the height or uh, the height of the any landform will decrease it means that the river or any kind of erosional agent will erode the area or the landforms and also the aggradational process aggradational process means the height of the landform will increase that means the any kind of erosional agents or the agents they will deposit the eroded materials on the earth surface and definitely the height of the landform will increase in that case also there is a clear distinctive difference between the geomorphic concept and also the agent activity concept and now the gradation gradation is a identical theory or the concept where is actually the the sign has been given that is known as congruent 
what is the meaning of congruent congruent means the identically equal there is a equilibrium state if suppose if the degradation and the aggradation become a equilibrium state that is known as gradation so according to the geomorphic processes the gradation means the degradational rate and the aggradational rate should be identically same it means that any any kind of erosional agent for example river if river will erode an area if river will deposit on that particular area that means the erosional rate and the depositional rate should be the same only in that case the degradational rate and the aggradational rate of the landform should be identically equal so that is known as the gradation in that case we can say the congruent sign to denote the gradational state of the particular landform